Thank you for joining us today. Excuse me for my throat congestion. My name is Alex Chapin and I'm a member of the research committee for BIPSA USA. I'm a co-host, I mean co-chair for the webinar working group. And this evening or today we have a great webinar on the next generation of building scientists, solar decathlon by Tyler Ryan and Gokul Paranjoti, who are both from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Webinar is hosted by BIPSA Research Committee, and the goal is to share new ideas from research to the building simulation community. If you have any questions during the webinar, put them in the Q&A window. Um, you can put them in chat as well, but there's a specific Q&A window, I believe, let me see. Well, if you can't find it, then just put it in the chat. We'll, we'll get your questions at the end. We'll have about 40 minutes for the presentation and then we'll have time for Q&A. And at the end, you can also unmute yourself if you're on Zoom and um, say your question out loud so we can have a little bit of a dialogue going. Now I wanna let, introduce Taylor and Gokul to you. Taylor Ryan is a project coordinator in the Residential Building Solutions and Scaling Group at NREL. She supports workforce development and technology deployment programs, including the Solar Decathlon Collegiate Competition. Taylor leads programmatic recruiting and outreach, business process optimization, and event planning and logistics. Taylor is currently pursuing a Master's of Science in Applied Business Analytics from Boston University through which she hopes to employ data-driven approaches to increase project impact at NRA. Gokul is a researcher in the Communities and Urban Science Research Group at NRA. He previously worked as an energy modeling consultant for four years before joining NRA. At NRA, he focuses on modeling and investigating novel technologies related to heat pumps, water heating, thermal storage, in addition to helping cities and communities plan their roadmaps to achieving their zero carbon and zero energy goals equitably in the building sector. He also supports the Solar Decathlon as a technical advisor on the design challenge. Uh, go, ahead, go, go, go ahead and start the presentation from your side. Gokul, I think you might be muted. Of course. Uh, um, but thanks, Alex, for the introduction and welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. It's going to be on the next generation of building scientists. We're going to be talking about the Solar Decathlon program. Um, just a little bit on the speakers. I think Alex did a great job of introducing us. Taylor is the Design Challenge Assistant Competition Manager. Um, in this Solar Decathlon Design Challenge, um, and I'm a technical advisor for the same. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so a little overview of what we're going to be seeing through the course of this presentation. We're going to look at why we came up or why, why the Solar Decathlon came up, what it is, how we're ensuring access and equity of the competition to everyone, and we'll also be going through a few highlights, technology highlights from participating teams. And then we'll end with talking about opportunities to engage with teams yourself. So why the Solar Decathlon? So um, before we begin on why Solar Decathlon, I want to give a brief summary on why buildings, right? And this might be uh, preaching to the choir for the audience here. Buildings account for almost 40% of the total energy consumed in the United States. The uh, residential sector accounts for 55% of that total energy and the commercial sector accounts for 45%. Uh, but the real uh, pie one that, is that I really wanted to highlight here was the energy breakdown of that 55 and 45%. So on-site renewables are 4% of all residential 
energy consumption, and they're two percent of all commercial energy consumption. So there is a big gap um, in filling residential and commercial energy buildings, uh, buildings as energy with clean energy, uh, with renewables and clean energy. Um, so we go to the next slide. Um, and this energy has only increased historically. So from 1950 for residential and commercial, this, the energy graph has steadily been increasing and policies to combat, combat this are just now seeing, we're just now seeing the effects of policies that were introduced to combat this, right? So for context, in 1970, the Clean Air Act, and in 1972, the Clean Water Act were passed. In 1975, the first ASHRAE energy standards were published. If we had started building zero energy buildings at in this time frame, we would have been able to see a uh, a more significant decline in the energy consumption now, right? So laws that were enacted almost 50 years ago are only seeing, we're only seeing the impacts now. Granted, there have been a lot more aggressive lobbying and acts and research that's been going on in the last 20 years, and that's helped uh, silo the curve a little bit, but we're still growing, growing. and. Uh, that is also because we are, as a population globally, we're growing, and as a population, we need shelter, and we're building more homes than ever. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So a lot more, a lot of homes are getting built in the U.S., and a lot more are getting retrofitted. Uh, we have to solve for zero energy, low carbon, and demand flexible built environments. And these are just some parts of the equation in housing. We're looking at embodied carbon. We're looking at demand flexibility with the grid and how to integrate better with the grid. And we're looking at a different renewable energy options and how microgrids can help us. And we are also looking at how to equitably distribute clean energy benefits across diverse income and ethnicity backgrounds, income, ethnicity, and gender backgrounds. Uh, so to do this, we need a diverse workforce. We need to create local champions in communities that are able to go and address these problems themselves and are able to provide solutions th themselves. So we need more hands and deck to solve this together. Um, and that is why we're here. Uh, at Solar Decathlon. Uh, I think Taylor is going to give a brief description on what the Solar Decathlon is now. Yes. Thank you, Gokul, for going over the why of Solar Decathlon. So I'll be talking about the what is Solar Decathlon. And so our kind of high level mission statement is that we prepare innovators to design and construct high performance, low carbon buildings through hands on collegiate competitions, professional continuing education and high school programs. And really the aim of all of this is to be a leader in workforce development in the buildings industry. And so probably a lot of you are familiar with Solar Decathlon, and we have evolved quite a bit in the past 20 years. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary this year, which is super exciting. But we started as a collegiate competition in 2002, and at that time, we were a biennial competition to build and present single-family residential solar houses. And really, at that time, we were more of like a proving ground for residential solar energy and specifically proving to the public that this could work. They could have solar panels on their home and their house would still work and deliver them energy. Um, and so when the competition started, we had student teams transporting homes to the National Mall or other, other centralized locations for a public exhibition. And this public exhibition would usually be 10 days to two weeks where 100,000 visitors would come and talk to Solar Decathlon teams about their project. And in terms of scale, at that time, we were about 20 teams per competition edition running every two years when Solar Decathlon first started. Um, so fast forward to now, 20 years later, we now have two challenges, the design challenge and build challenge, which we'll talk about more. We span both residential and commercial building types. 
And compared to when we started in 2002, we now have about 120 to 150 teams participating annually. So the scale of the competition is just much bigger than we for when we first started. And I'll also say in terms of the number of student participants in the past 20 years, we have scaled that quite a bit. We have around 25,000 alumni from over 40 countries represented in the competition edition since 2002. And so this graphic provides a nice overview of our flagship programs, which are the design challenge and the build challenge. So um, those are basically two competition tracks for students to compete in. So the first is the design challenge. Um, like Google said, that is our annual design only competition that runs from about October to April each year. And so students work in multidisciplinary teams to come up with a zero energy building project across one of these six divisions that, again, span both residential and commercial building types. So for residential, we have new housing, retrofit housing, and attached housing. And then for commercial, we have multifamily, office, and education buildings. So not only has the scale of solar decathlon changed in terms of the number of students competing, but also, you know, the number of buildings that we're helping students think about um, and design zero energy buildings around. And so we have that design challenge and then we also have the build challenge, which really more closely resembles solar decathlon competitions of the past. Um, it is a two year, it's still a two year design and build competition that's focused on residential housing types only. Um, however, the main thing that's changed with the build challenge now is that it's a fully all local build structure. So the teams are not, you know, transporting their homes across the country or the world for this centralized public showcase. They are um, designing, constructing, or retrofitting a permanent home in their local communities that really addresses a long-term need. So we've seen in this all local build structure, we've seen teams address affordable housing issues in their community. We've seen them work with a builder on single family uh, residential housing to try to get that to scale given their local environmental conditions. So the benefits of Build Challenge are much more distributed now in communities across the country. Um, and kind of the main thread that ties both the design challenge and the build challenge together and what may, makes us a decathlon is our 10 contests. So these have all, also evolved in the past 20 years. We've you know always had architecture and engineering, but we've evolved these contests to be more responsive to industry needs and market needs. So for instance, at this point in the competition, we have the embodied environmental impact contest, and that looks at the life cycle analysis of buildings. Um, we have the durability and resilience contest, and that looks at the building's resilience to increasing natural disasters. So these contests change over time, but students in both the design challenge and the build challenge are tasked with addressing these in their projects. And then I'll just show for a broader program overview, this, this graphic um, gives some nice details on that. So at the top, we have, again, our flagship programs of the Design Challenge and Build Challenge. We also have the Building Science Education Series, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then we also have some sub-programs now that are specifically trying to um, address workforce development from both a high school perspective and a prof existing professionals perspective. So that's Solar Decathlon Pathways and Solar Decathlon Pro, respectively. Um, and so really with Solar Decathlon over the past 20 years, we've tried to be a little bit more all-encompassing in the audiences that we are targeting through our programming and the audiences that receive the benefits of um, Solar Decathlon. And so to talk a little bit about building science education. So our building science edu education series is available for all learners. We've seen high school students take it. We obviously have our solar decathlon students take it. We've seen professionals benefit from this, but it is a series of short video modules and quizzes that are really designed for learners to build a strong foundation in building science and zero energy design skills. 
And so the topics covered in the building science education series range, range from obviously those zero energy design principles. And we also touch on things like building envelope and HVAC design, lighting and plug loads, um, planning and setting goals. So the topics in this series really run the gamut. And from a, a competition perspective, part of the reason that we introduced this is to try and level the playing field across different teams. So even if they weren't you know, getting this education as part of their existing curriculum, they have a way to get this education and, and knowledge through solar decathlon participation. And to talk about one of our sub programs, which is SD Pro. So this is a program that's designed to provide early to mid career industry professionals with an opportunity to develop building science expertise, specifically through a zero energy design practicum. So participants in SD Pro go through a small cohort, usually about 10 other professional participants with an expert facilitator. And they actually go through in this practicum, the process of designing a zero energy building and revising it for a zero energy target. Um, the participants in SD Pro get continuing education credits along with obviously um, these new zero energy design skills. So if anyone's interested more in this topic, SD Pro is a program that we're hosting in an ongoing way with um, one of our partners and sponsors, the American Institute of Architects. So uh, we plan to start another cohort in early 2023. So we can send you more information about that as well. And then finally, on the kind of what is solar decathlon, um, we always like to include this and it, it seems obvious, but this um, focus on helping students learn more than they would in a typical course alone is really what drives the organizer team and what we're constantly thinking about as we think about programming for student teams. And this is not only through, you know, the building science education series and getting different knowledge and skills um, on building science through that, but also through building professional development skills. They have to present to jurors and convey their project and make a compelling point about why they should win in their division or why they should be an overall winner of the competition. So they learn how to you know, work in multidisciplinary teams. So the Solar Decathlon experience, we hope provides students with something that is really unique and maybe something that they can't just get through a class alone. Um, and switching gears a little bit here, so Gokul introduced this at the beginning of the call, but a big focus for our team, especially recently, has been increasing competition access and increasing equity across both the design challenge and the build challenge. And here what I wanted to show is just in the past five years, the total number of collegiate institutions, we've seen that scaled up and we've seen growth in that. And we've also seen more growth in terms of the number of competing minority serving institutions and community college participants. And really here as a team, we're thinking through, so how do we not only connect with these different types of institutions, but how do we make sure that the competition is, um, you know, offers them the resources and the support that they need to be successful and to maximize their learning experience. So this is something that we're thinking about constantly and um, looking to make more progress on as the years go on. And kind of in that same vein, just to throw out a couple metrics for context from the previous editions of Solar Decathlon. So we've been at about 30% minority serving institutions in terms of team applications. So these are schools that come on at the beginning of the competition. Um, we have seen less team retention in terms of minority serving institutions. So fewer of those teams might not submit or fewer of those teams submit interim deliverables or actually complete the project. And that's really something that we're trying to address here as well. So we're making progress, but there is definitely still progress to be made for solar decathlon in this vein. And then finally, to 
just show where we're at in terms of our solar decathlon student body demographics. So we are approaching a 50-50 split between um, students who uh, identify as men or women in the competition. We still have some work to do there, as you can see in the pie chart on the left. And then in terms of race demographics, um, we're at just under 50% white in terms of the student body. Um, and really the reason we've been collecting these demographics is to make sure that we're building out the program in a way that actually represents our student body in a way that they can resonate with what they're seeing in Solar Decathlon. And so for instance, when we think, think about the juries who will evaluate the student team submissions, we always have these demographics in mind and making sure that we are representing our student teams appropriately. And so with that, I think I will pass it back to you, Gokul. Thanks. Um, and like Taylor said, a lot of our work uh, over the last few years has been the equitable distribution of the competition. And through that, the knowledge that uh, Solar Decathlon and the US Department of Energy wants to share with uh, growing building scientists. Um, and one of the um, interesting things that we found with our in-person event was that was that we were we thought we were restricting participation to, to teams that could attend um, in person only. Um, and so we switched to a hybrid event. Of, of course, the pandemic helped. Um, and we were able to see a big growth in uh, at, in, in the diversity of our applicants and our participants. Uh, so the hybrid events actually helped us to fairly compete regardless of access to institutional resources. And a lot of students said that they have felt more comfortable uh, knowing that they didn't need to fly in to our lab in Denver. The lab's pretty cool, but uh, with different resources. Um, so that was one of the things that we noticed and we changed and we're continuously working on improving and changing things like this to make um, make this uh, education material more accessible. Uh, so moving on, one of the most interesting things about the Solar Decathlon, um, and I've only been with the program, this is my second year now, is seeing some of these presentations. Um, I have um, history as an energy modeler and just looking at how, how the, some of the models that the students build, some of the concepts they imagine and design for is just mind blowing and it's truly amazing. Uh, I, uh, so we, the next few slides will highlight some of the technologies that uh, our winners and finalists came up, uh, came up with. Uh, so Georgia Tech uh, competed in the new, was that the attached housing? I forget. Retrofit housing. Retrofit housing. Sorry. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, so they competed in the retrofit housing. They were the finalists and they won their division. And they also won the overall Solar Decathlon last year. Uh, so their, what I found most interesting about their presentation was their equity-centered approach. They kind of looked at the the structure they were retrofitting and considered all stakeholders there. So a single mother with children, a single person, parents with one, parents with one child. And if you go to the next slide, one of their uh, standout proposals was how to make the housing itself more affordable with resources, rebates, incentives that were available locally and in-house. They did a full financial model um, and it was pretty impressive to see the depth of their models, which um, there's, if there's more time I can explain at the end, uh, but uh, they looked, uh, they basically got the homeowner's cost to reduce by a hundred thousand dollars almost. Um, and that was, amazing. Um, they also did a full-blown energy simulation in Open Studio and were able to predict uh, around $1,400 of uh, utility savings per year. Um, and keeping in mind, these are undergraduate and graduate students, and this was, you know, work 
I would probably do is in my consulting avatar. Uh, so this is really great to see. Uh, the next technology I'd like to highlight is uh, from Myeongji University in South Korea. Uh, so one other thing um, about Solar Decathlon is though we are US centric, we, we don't discourage international participation. And we usually see participation from all over. We had teams uh, from this year, we just completed our registration application and we had teams from every continent except Antarctica register to for the design challenge competition next year. Uh, so Myeongji University were one of the new entrants last year and uh, they're located in Seoul, South Korea and they reimagined uh, their hanok or a traditional South Korean housing. Um, and they actually changed the end use of the building itself from um, a house to an office building. Uh, and they, um, this was really amazing to see that they used all the, the technologies are just highlighted here, but the whole reimagining of the space and then having all those you know, novel technologies put into a very traditional house to create value for the community as well as the building uh, was something great. Um, and they were, they actually have a prototype of the, the Hanok. Um, I was able to actually see that when I was in South Korea um, and they're experimenting with the glass facades and thermal breaks and getting getting to actually build their design too, uh, which I thought was really awesome. Um, and I'd pause there to say a lot of our teams have different considerations. In South Korea, there's a space con constraint um, and that was their major driver behind you know, thinking of moving a housing you know, the use case to an office use case. There are other teams which designed in Argentina and they had community water problems. And they, so they came up with innovative methods to uh, harness water and use water and move there. Uh, the, the original house was using hydronic heating and they were able to imagine moving away from water to um, other so other renewable sources of heating and cooling. Um, we've had teams from Iran, which uh, there's, you know, the, they tend to build more uh, structurally upwards as opposed to wider. Uh, so, and there, there are interesting structural challenges with that. Uh, and they were able to bring out new technologies and impress that uh, impress us with that also. Uh, um, so yeah, this uh, Myeongji competed in the office buildings category, um, and they were a they were the winners of their division. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and the so University of Arizona competed in the multifamily building category. Um, and they were the winners of the um, residential. So multifamily below three stories, they were the winners of the residential buildings category in the overall Solar Decathlon competition this year. Um, they had a ton of impressive technologies too. What I found the most impressive was the organic photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaics they were using. Um, and it's integrated into their canopy uh, and it was a pretty cool design for, for us to see as well. Uh, and the why I brought this up was uh, to also highlight that we have a diverse set of skills that teams, the winning teams typically embody. They're building science engineers and building science, uh, building energy modelers, but they're also, you know, real estate professionals, there are professionals who are coming in from with a chemical science background who just want to build. There are professionals who, who you know, maybe practice the trades um, and they want to learn more about the science portion of it. So this competition over the last 20 years has traditionally been attracting a diverse pool of students. Um, and every year, I am surprised to see uh, pleasantly surprised to see the diversity across the disciplines that uh, apply for the Solar Decathlon. 
Um, then moving on. Great. Thanks, yeah. Vocal. And one yeah. last technology highlight that I'll give actually from our build challenge. Um, so University of Colorado Boulder were the winners of the 2020 build challenge. And their project was a 1700 square foot house with an attached ADU in Fraser, Colorado. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Fraser, it is one of our highest elevation mountain towns, um, you know, super cold climate. And they integrated, you know, an all electric design, um, sheep's wool for insulation, cold climate heat pumps. And the cool thing about this project is the utility there has actually outlawed new gas additions. And so builders in the industry are coming to the CU Boulder team and asking them to use their project as a kind of roadmap and a model for new development. And so this just goes to show another solar decathlon team that's using innovative technology and actually helping to transform the market in their particular um, locality. And so with that, we'll move on to some conclusions here, but uh, we wanted to specifically mention this performance modeling advisors opportunity that is available to professionals in the ABIPSA network. Um, so we are doing this performance modeling advisors where we actually would pair you this year with a design challenge team to specifically help them with performance modeling throughout the competition. And so that would be from, at this point, December or January through April, 2023. Um, I think we found last year, that, that was the first year we ran this performance modeling advisors program. The time commitment was around five to 10 hours working with a student team. And what's really important about this is there are some teams in Solar Decathlon who might just be, for instance, all architecture students. And so you can see one of our faculty here from Howard University just expressing how critical this ABIPSA performance modeling advisor opportunity was to her team to make sure that they could successfully finish their project and successfully compete in Solar Decathlon. And so if you're interested in this, we have the, the web page there. And you can also send an email to Gokul to um, be paired with a solar decathlon team and we would super appreciate your your support in that and your support of solar decathlon teams and another way that professionals can get involved in the future if you're interested we are always looking for jurors so these are industry experts who evaluate student team submissions and listen to team presentations during our competition event so you would have the opportunity to come to uh, NREL in Golden Colorado and interact with hundreds of solar decathlon students and one of the best weekends of the year. Um, but this is also a great opportunity for you to connect with other industry experts. And um, yeah, a lot of the times our jury panels are super experienced, super impressive panels of industry experts. And we welcome you to kind of uh, put your name in the hat for a juror opportunity as well. And finally, uh, as in every presentation, we have to thank our Solar Decathlon sponsors and sponsors of Solar Decathlon really help us put on a successful competition event every April um, and support us in hosting hundreds of Solar Decathlon students at NREL. And also wanted to specifically acknowledge our steward level sponsor this year, Legions, for their generous support of Solar Decathlon. And so with that, we kind of talked about some of these opportunities to help us spread the word about Solar Decathlon, but we always welcome professionals to engage with us. You know, if you know any students or faculty at your alma mater who might be interested in participating, we're always interested in that. Um, if you're interested in SD Pro and joining a future cohort, you can reach out to us. And if you're interested in, of course, becoming a performance modeling advisor or a juror, um, yeah, please, please engage with us. But with that, I think that's everything Gokul and I plan to cover. So I think we'll just open it up for questions. Thank you, Taylor and Gokul. That was great. I am going to put a link in the chat for anyone who's interested in volunteering to help out with the research committee. There's a form there that you can fill out your information and you can become a part of organizing things such as this webinar. And I 
I haven't seen any questions in the chat. And let me check YouTube real quick. Nothing there. So we are currently open for anyone that wants to unmute themselves and ask a question or put something in the chat at the moment. And while we're waiting, I think I may try to see if I can come up with something to ask myself. Um, well, actually, first of all, while you guys are, th while everyone's thinking of questions, let me go through a few other things that I wanted to talk about at the end of our meeting, just to give you some time. And let's see. If you are watching on YouTube, please remember to like the video and subscribe to our channel. And of those of you who aren't on YouTube right at the moment, you can go there to see, uh, replay the webinar if you missed something or if you want to check something again. I also wanted to mention that next month, well, our next webinar month, um, this is technically November's webinar, but we're skipping December because of the holidays. And our next webinar will be in January. And it will be with Dr. Clayton Miller, who's going to present on approaching built environment analysis challenges through generalizability and coding skills. And that's going to be January 26th at 3 p.m. Pacific time. And I'm going to try to find the link for that and repaste that into the chat. So here's a link for more information on that. And I believe that's all the, the wrap up announcements I have. So hopefully someone has a question to ask. Um, I guess I'll go ahead with an easy one. How long has been, and maybe you said this, but I don't think I heard it. How long have you been doing the, the components outside of the, the design challenge and the build challenge, like with the training, the learning, and like the, the pro, and there's, a, there's other like, I think there's like three different things. Has that been pretty new? Yeah, very new. So I've worked on the team for about three years now, and they've all come to fruition in the time that I've worked on the Solar Decathlon organizer team. So I think the first year we um, incorporated the building science education series as part of the curriculum for students was two years ago. Before that, we did work with a, a third party company to kind of deliver that building science education, but it's only been recently that we've done it in-house. Um, and in terms of Solar Decathlon Pathways and SC Pro, those are just within the past year that those have been implemented. So yeah, we have, we've scaled in our programming quite a bit in the past few years. Great. Um, does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? And while everyone's thinking of a question. Um, this, for the energy modelers here, and for those who will view this video later um, with a recording, uh, the, uh, we're partnering with, I would say, USA for the, um, I mean, Taylor mentioned about, talked about this, uh, with the, uh, I would say, performance modeling advisor program. So if you're an energy modeler and you, if you'd like to spend some time mentoring students on their energy models and talking to them about the do's and don'ts of specific software, uh, do reach out to us. There's a, a form I pasted in the IBIPSA USA page where you can apply directly, or you can also send me an email um, and I'll get that looked at. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, let's see. I can ask a question. I have oh, great. one question in my mind. This is Aisha. Um, so I've been following Solar Decathlon for a long time, but I'm I'm wondering, like, do you guys end up producing any kind of like conference or journal paper for those who are not familiar, like outside of this whole competition? Um, yeah. Thank you for your presentation, also. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for your question. And so just to make sure I'm answering it right, you were asking if we kind of promote the competition through those conference or journal channels. Yes, and also after after the um, you know, once you complete like two years, um is is did you somehow manage to produce any conference or journal paper related how you 
um, process your solar decathlon competitions and how it has been changed from, because it's a good amount of data that you've worked with a couple of competition, like the competitors and different, like you talked about diversity, but um, you know, it could be a great publication like from 2002 until now. So I'm just wondering uh, if yeah. that is the case. <laughs> Yes, and, and definitely, I think we're always super focused on a team as gathering data and metrics and making sure we promote what we've done as a program as much as possible. And in the past year, I think our team has gone to eight different conferences or something like that to promote Solar Decathlon. And usually we try to give a little bit of a history of the evolution of the competition, but specifically talk about to your point, what the trends are and what they have been in the past two years and kind of compiling and delivering that data to different audiences. And we do also have um, journal paper, papers and that sort of thing. And um, kind of separately, the Department of Energy does their own evaluations of the program that are less public. But um, yes, that's something that we're focused on and um, a uh, great idea for us to continue doing. And Gokul, did you have anything to add to that? I did. Um, our most notable conference presentation was in the ACEEE. So if you um, get a hold of that presentation, uh, or if of that uh, paper or presentation, or we could send it to you, uh, that's one. Uh, and with data too, right? It's awesome to mine all of this data and look at things, but we also have started collecting data on different things only very recently. Uh, so that's another internal conversation we're having about, oh, how would this have been 15 years ago and 20 years ago? Um, because you know conversations evolve in society uh, every five or 10 years and uh, the data we want to collect is often not the data we already have. Uh, so that's been um, something interesting to look at as well. Uh, thank you. And then just one, uh, so I'm not sure if I'm really qualified to give you a suggestion, but um, uh, like I know that you've been collecting, you've, you will be collecting data um, once the houses are built uh, for the Solar Decathlon uh, Build Challenge. Uh, and then I wonder if you guys are thinking about also getting the data after the houses are occupied. So is that like a, something on your list or just, you know, pretty, because generally, you know, all the marketing lead and bream and all these certificates are like, unless uh, the um, construction company or whoever gets the lead certificate and states to get after occupation data, uh, they don't do, uh, they don't do it. So I thought like, you know, the Department of Energy could somehow collect the data um, before and after and how, because occupancy plays an important role on our energy consumption um, a lot, so. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion and um, specifically relevant for our solar decathlon build challenge where the houses are actually built obviously and mm -hmm. we are fo definitely focused on performance monitoring and that sort of thing i think one of the challenges with that too is what will be the long-term use in, of the house and sometimes that is um, you know, just going to a private buyer and what are they comfortable with and what do they want to work with us on in terms of performance monitoring over time. But as this is our first edition as an all local build competition. Mm -hmm. And so in the previous uh, Solar Decathlon editions, they have come to the National Mall with their house and then the house has had different types of long-term uses. And sometimes they were just disassembled. So that opportunity for long-term monitoring was not there. So this is now becoming especially relevant for us and we appreciate that feedback. And um, I think it's definitely on our minds to Thank make you sure so we're much. talking I mean, about data. You guys data. are already doing an amazing job. So I just wanted to, you know, yeah, somehow that's great. Really good contribute. Thank you. Yeah. Gokul, and did you have anything to add to that? Not specifically with Solar Decathlon, but it brings up a bigger question, right? With our performance standards and like grading standards, our lead 
or you know green building standards we're not testing post occupancy houses or we're not holding people accountable uh, so then how good are these standards themselves but that's a that's a billion dollar question that everyone's been uh, really discussing trying to you. respond right. yeah i know yeah yeah but thank you so much yeah Thank you. That was a great question. There are multiple questions. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to share or ask? I guess I have a question, um, something kind of interesting. Like, what is the, you went through a couple of use cases like that were interesting, like the South Korea and different things. But I guess, was there like, um, any project that particularly kind of stood out for a build that was, or even a design, I guess, that was just kind of like really unique or interesting that maybe you, have, you haven't talked about today? Just something that sticks out in your mind? I think one of the main unique things in the past two years is our increased focus on retrofits. And so we talked about it for a design challenge, but that retrofit housing division is new within the past two years. And in fact, the students can do a retrofit project across any of those divisions except new housing, which is specifically focused on new construction. And so that is something we're really trying to encourage in the competition. And like Gogol mentioned, Georgia Tech was our first division or our, our first grand winner rather from a retrofit housing division. So that's definitely new. And in Build Challenge, we saw our first retrofit actually as well in the 2020 Build Challenge. And uh, the University of Denver team did a, a retrofit of a house in Denver. And then in this 2023 Build Challenge edition, we have another team doing a retrofit project. So that is super unique and just something we have not seen at all in solar decathlon in the past, but also super important. And we're trying to think through how to encourage students to focus on existing building stocks since um, that is obviously a need. So I think those are kind of unique projects within the past couple of years. Gokul, did you have other things to add? Um, as a throwing my energy modeler hat on, I was very impressed to see that modeling had progressed from just building energy modeling to a holistic case. They were modeling for LCA. So they were Athena or some of the EC3 or other softwares being used. They were um, having structural design model. Some of the students submitted C CFD models, which I was like, wow. Um, and they were able to bring this in uh, and Truly, this is why I think this is almost at industry level, uh, right? Because they were able to combine this all in in one presentation and give a holistic view of the building. Uh, the other highlight that stood out to me was a lot of students are thinking about not just the building, but also improving the community, the local ownership and uh, just equitable access to buildings, um, more uh, even in commercial buildings that I've seen teams talk about, you know, having access space for uh, shelters when, when, you know, the office is not being used. Um, and those were some, uh, and the more, we're seeing, we're beginning to see more of that. Um, and that's very inspiring that, you know, students are thinking about it. Great. Um, another thing I was thinking about, unless someone else wants to jump in real quick, was for the bill challenge, is there any, um, it's probably, I'm gonna guess it's hard to do this now with it being distributed local um, builds instead of everyone coming in to DC, but is there any emphasis on trying to do like testing of the building actually built or retrofit such as like blower door tests or things like that just to see like when you're doing the you know the rating teams against each other like what kind of information do you get based on the actual build versus what they like talk about in their design process and stuff yeah what i would say to that is so we 
And the build challenge, a little bit different from the design challenge. We have out of the 10 contests, I think five of them are measured contests and five of them are, or rather six are juried and four are measured contests. And so for those measured contests, we are actually sending um, instrumentation, instrumentation and measuring equipment to their houses. And we're doing things like a blower door test um, and other types of energy performance testing and monitoring in that way. And that goes into part of their scores and overall standing in the competition. Um, so that's definitely, that's something we do before we announce winners, but um, to Aisha's point, we're not doing that necessarily after the competition right now in terms of a long-term monitoring um, capabilities or anything like that. But Gokul, did you want to add to that? Um, we have, uh, I think we're in the process of having standardized test procedures for all students. Uh, they perform the tests themselves, but the results are reported in a format um, and our experts at uh, the lab will uh, judge them. Great. I really enjoy that there's the hands-on kind of real-world learning that goes in with the multidisciplinary teams and stuff. I was not a solar decathlon participant. So it, when I was in school, so I'm really glad I'm in the team at least. We have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, thank you everyone again for attending in person and also for those who watch the recording later. And thank you, Taylor and Gokul. I really enjoyed this and I hope everyone else got a lot of it as well. And please go see the links that were posted if you want to volunteer or get the word out about Soda Catholic. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yep. And thanks, Alex. Bye.